Uh, well, thank you very much. Can you all hear me fine? I think there's a microphone here, so it sounds like... OK, good. Um, well, I'd like to start by thanking the Society very much for inviting me to, um, to come and present this lecture tonight um, and also to give a shameless plug for one of the Society's recent publications. And I have got copies at the front if anyone does want to buy a copy. It saves you postage and packing from Edinburgh, is the plus side, and it means you can have a look at it as well. Um, and this book came out just before Christmas. Um, before I actually... Um, give the main talk, I thought um, a, a slightly amusing aside in that because I work for the Royal Commission, we have a communications um, side to it and we have a very talented um, spin doctor, is what we very politely call him, um, who, bless him, put out a, a press release on my book a few weeks ago and it was picked up by um, a fascinating range of, um, range of sources. Uh, my favourite one um, being the fact that, um, that I, I'm a movie fan, so having myself next to an image from Centur Centurion, having me quoted, sadly they all put my, decided they wanted to put my age in the article, and they all got it wrong, and I am younger than it says in the press. <laughs> but uh, not by much, but next time I'm asked my age, I'm going to say 25. Um, the other thing that, uh, the fascinating thing about doing um, press and publicity for a book, which was quite a new experience for me, was that I was actually asked by our um, PR guy, you know, you mentioned Kintor in, your, um, in the press release, you know, roughly how many football pitches is it? And I said, oh, I have no idea. I've, I don't think in terms of football pitches. So I then went on to Google to find out how big, it, how big a football pitch was to then find out that there isn't a standard size to, for football pitches. So it's amazing that when you do research on the Roman army, it's amazing the things you can actually learn. Anyway, Kintor, in case anyone's interested, is about 60 football pitches. So, but I, I, I didn't appreciate it. That's how, you know, to get it across to some people. The fascinating thing about all this press and publicity, that, that for very, a very brief second, I was four in the archaeology chart on Amazon, <laughs> next to Mary Beard. <laughs> Doesn't get better than that. I, the last time I checked, I was down in 89th or something, so it's gone. But, you know, it was, it was a brief, brief moment of fame. Anyway, on to tonight's lecture. I thought I would talk about, um, explain what a camp is, because you've probably heard lots of, had lots of lectures on the Romans in Scotland, but actually explain what's so fascinating about camps, why they're, why they're interesting, why I find them particularly interesting, um, and why Scotland is probably the best place in the Roman Empire to actually study Roman camps. Um, brief history of archaeological research, because that's a key element to how we know what we know their survival and distribution, and then a bit about what their light forms, defences, gates, annexes, I'll explain about that. And then the really interesting bit, the context and their dates. So, starting with what is a camp? Well, essentially they are rectangular structures, playing card shape. Um, generally, not always, sometimes they change their shape a little bit, square, rectangular. Um, they're laid out in a particular way. I mean, they look a bit like Roman forts in outline, some of them are a lot bigger because they contained larger armies, and I'll come on to that. And they were generally constructed for a variety of purposes. And we generally split it into four types of categories. There are marching camps, campaign camps, which is primarily what we have in Scotland, and that's basically what I'm going to be talking about tonight. Um, construction or labour camps, and these were um, sites that were occupied by soldiers who were building something, so the Antonine Wall, frontiers, roads, that sort of things. Siege camps... Um, some of the big ones around the empire, and then practice camps. And essentially a camp is what it, what it, what it sounds like. It's something that was occupied for a, um, a short period of time. It wasn't something that was occupied for a prolonged period. There was no intention when they set up a, a site to actually stay there for long term. It was a transient thing. As I say, I'm going to be talking primarily tonight about marching camps, and these are as it says there, they're enclosures housing troops who are away from their base. Now, they may well be on campaign. You get very large ones where you have huge conquest armies marching into territories. But you also have them marching around territories that have already been conquered. Sometimes it might be a show of force. Um, other times it might be to, put, to quell a local uprising. Um, and, or, or it could just be that they're moving from one, uh, one, place, one base to another. I'll quickly talk about the other types of camps and then I'm going to focus on marching camps. Construction camps, we're also very fortunate in Scotland that we can identify construction camps because by and large, if you've got an enclosure with a rampart and a ditch around it, 
um, which would have had lots and lots of tents inside it. Actually deciding what those guys were there to do is not necessarily that straightforward. But along the line of the frontier in Scotland, along the Antonine Wall, we have a whole series of them that are similar sizes, they're very close to the frontier. A couple of them have produced pottery which is dated to the late Hadrianic, early Antonine period, so therefore contemporary with the wall. Um, a couple of them have had, um, had secondary phases cut into them, but with the suggestion that it was a sh shortish time frame. So we can be fairly confident in saying that a large number of the camps lying along the Antonine Wall relate to the construction of the frontier. They're also fairly regularly spaced, but some of the gaps that you see are because of places like Falkirk and some of the urban conurbations that sit along the wall. Um, and another possible construction camp is this one in Perthshire at Steed Stalls, which is not far from the fortress, the legionary fortress at Inch uh, where you can see these um, upstanding features here, and then these tap holes in the crop. And these are quite possibly caused from, um, from lime kilns or something. There's been no excavation work, and I'd love it if somebody would stick a trench in one of these and actually tell us what they're for. But it, there's a possibility that it's to do with quarrying, and so that this had a, some form of construction purpose, possibly to do with a fortress. Um, and again, these are the ones on the Antonine Wall. They're all fairly similar in shape, and this is an example of one of them. By and large, the majority of camps are known from the air, so I'm afraid you're going to see a lot of green lines in fields and that sort of thing, but that's, um, that's the nature of what I do. Siege camps, well, um, Numantia in Spain, Masada in Israel are, are well-known sites of siege camps, and in fact, um, on the left-hand side, that's the siege ramp going up to the um, f uh, Herod's Fort at Machairus in Jordan. And you probably can't see, but that is a person standing on it, to give you an idea of the scale of the archaeology here. Um, when it comes to Scotland, well, Burns Walk in Dumfrieshire is the only site that can lay cl any form of claim to being a siege camp, and it's hotly disputed at the moment. It's one of these things that was claimed as a siege camp for years and then in the 60s the theory came in that it was a practice siege camp. Um, and then over the last five to ten years um, the idea that it might actually be a genuine siege has reared its head again. Um, and I was party to a group of people going out on site um, two years ago where we had basically 30 Roman frontier archaeologists standing on the site arguing whether or not it was a, a, a um, genuine siege or not, the jury's still out. Um, I would love to think that it was, but I do feel we need a bit more evidence. Practice camps, we haven't got any currently recorded in Scotland. Um, there are huge numbers of them in Wales. Wales seems to be, not up, parts of Upland Wales seems to have been the Roman equivalent of Salisbury Plain. Um, and you probably can't see these too well, but essentially practice camps are very, very small. This is Clundrinja Common, just out of Clundrinja Wells, and each of these little rectangles here is a camp. And in fact, on this air photograph, there's some little earthwork ones there. And the best example up at the top left is Brackley, which is up near, um, which is up in Snowdonia. And these are sites where they were clearly building corners and gates and they were focusing on building things and in the case of the one at Brathley the gates come so far into the centre you couldn't pitch a Roman tent I could probably just about get my little two-man tent into the centre of it around the gates but you couldn't actually inhabit these things so they must have been constructed for practice you also generally get them just outside auxiliary forts and they, um, and they cluster together so sometimes you, it was quite clear that they might have had a, a march to a site and then they built camps um, and I'm, I like to think, with my, with my interest in, in um, camps in northern Britain in particular, that actually a lot of these were possibly built in advance of campaigns into the north. Now, in terms of what a camp is, we, ha we are fortunate, of course, when we deal with the Roman period, that we do have sources, however biased they are. And so the top one um, from Vegetius, who wrote a um, military treatise, um, and he's... It's, it's an interesting treatise, but that's one of the examples of just what a camp might be. And then Josephus, who's a first century Jewish writer, um, telling us again about the rigid nature of the Roman army. We've got other sources as well. But at the bottom, uh, the quote here, they fire the camp, which they can easily reconstruct if required. Well, they clearly didn't always fire the camps, because if they did, we wouldn't have the remains that we have today. And another useful source is Trajan's column in Rome, which of course is set in the wars in Dacia, modern-day Romania. 
but again it shows it shows legionaries it shows soldiers <coughs> building camps and it's another source of source of information for us um, and here you have one of the sites on the on the column and this is clearly a temporary site in nature because we've actually got tents inside and that's what when, when you think of Roman sites you quite often think of forts with barrack blocks and wooden buildings and stone buildings particularly when you think of some of the sites on Hadrian's Wall for example and we've got to think about leather tents when we're thinking about, um, about camps. Um, and the other thing is in terms of scale, St. Leonard's in the Scottish borders on the left, um, only known from crop marks, is 170 acres in size, 70 hectares. It's the biggest camp anywhere in Europe. Um, until last autumn, it was the biggest camp anywhere in the empire, but they found a bigger one in Syria. <laughs> um, and, uh, and they have shown me the evidence, and it's genuine, I'm afraid. I couldn't just say, nah, it's because it's not Roman camps, it clearly is. Um, and that's the smallest one in Britain, which is, um, I think you can only really see it because I drew it with a thick pen. So just to give you an idea of scale, that's a practice camp, the one on the left is a marching camp, and I will be come back to St. Leonard's. But also I wanted to say we're not in isolation. There are more of them in Britain than anywhere else. There are more of them in Scotland than anywhere else. Um, but because of an expansion of aerial survey, particularly in Slovakia and Czech Republic, since the... Um, uh, since the uh, fall of the Russian bloc, or the fall of the USSR and its, and its bloc, there's been a huge amount of aerial survey here, which has resulted in a lot of camps being discovered. And the Slovakians in particular have got a camp that's not far from the Polish border, raising possibilities that we might actually start getting camps further north there. But they are recorded right around the empire. I've certainly seen examples of camps in Egypt and in the, in the Near East. But our knowledge of North Africa isn't quite as, as strong. Now, in terms of um, how we know what we know, well, we're also very fortunate um, in Britain and Scotland in particular that a lot of the early pioneers in terms of mapping, in terms of archaeological research, were doing work on, um, were interested in the Roman army. Robert Melville, who's an, really an un unsung hero of the, um, of the 18th century, went round and, uh, and on his horse rode round and visited a whole bunch of sites in Scotland and recognised them as temporary camps. Up until that point, a lot of the recognition had been of forts and fortresses and the more, and the, and the more permanent structures, the, the ones that have more longevity. And it was probably helped by the fact that some of these sites were, were called locally battle dikes, war dikes, and that sides of things. But he then, um, he didn't write anything about it. I think he was print posted to Granada or something shortly afterwards. But he then told William Roy, and you may have heard of William Roy because ultimately he was the man who potentially founded the Ordnance Survey. And this is, we don't know what he looks like, but there's a suggestion of this drawing um, that may be him, the military man at a Society of Antiquaries of London gathering um, with notes stuffed in his pocket. Um, and these are examples, William Roy mapped um, all the sites, Roman sites that he knew in the north um, and discovered quite a few himself. These are some of the ones that were discovered by Robert Melville. And uh, the plans are absolutely stunning. A lot of these sites have since been ploughed out. So Roy re recorded them as earthworks before they became um, just crop marks that we could only see from aerial survey. And the other thing about Roy's maps is that they are remarkably accurate when you compare them to modern day plans. He really was an extremely skilled cartographer, as well as being really quite works of art. Um, 20th century, the main thing that's expanded our knowledge of Roman camps is aerial survey. And this uh, very exciting pie chart over here has showed you that actually 82% of camps in Scotland have been recorded from the air. So although we had a reasonable base of knowledge before the 1930s, 1940s, it's, um, it's the last sort of 70 years that has really seen an explosion in our knowledge. And that's by and large down to um, three people in particular. OGS Crawford from the Ordnance Survey, who did the first archaeological flight in Scotland in 1930. Professor St. Joseph in the middle um, from Cambridge University, who did a, a huge amount of flying and recovery of sites in the 40s, 50s and 60s in particular. And then Gordon Maxwell on the right, who, um, who will be at my lecture tomorrow night, so it's another reason for putting this slide in, to slightly embarrass him, because I used to work with Gordon before he retired. Um, and he's a former president of the society. And he set up the flying program in Scotland in the mid-1970s. 
And all three of them had research interests in the Roman period, and as a result, there's been perhaps a slight bias on recording Roman sites, but that's been a huge benefit for those of us studying them. And in fact, this is one of the sites, this is Galaberry in Dumfries, and it's one of the sites that was recorded by Crawford on, his, on that flight in 1930. He didn't take a camera with him, unfortunately, but he flew back nine years later, so this photograph was actually taken in 1939. Can you see the crop marks? Would you like me to point out crop mark, the crop marks at all, or is everyone seeing them fine? It's this, this is in grass, this darker mark here, and, that is the, and that's the camp. Now, what that's left us with is a very good base of knowledge, and this is a distribution map of camps currently known in Scotland. As I say, when it comes to how they're recorded, the very tall columns that you see are all the aerial survey ones. And this slide only goes up to um, the 2000s, but if I actually added another column to 2010, there was a new one discovered last year. Um, again, from scrutiny of aerial photographs and then, um, and then additional aerial survey, which has recovered it. And that's down in the southwest, which is one of, our, one of the areas of Scotland, if I go back to the previous one. It's one of the areas where there are camps further down, so there must be more because they must have constructed some on the way to marching to these. Um, when it comes to this part of the world, we've got a huge number of camps, but our knowledge is very much based, um, a lot of it's based on the work of St. Joseph, um, who was the guy in the, in the center of the photograph that I showed a little while ago. And he put these tiny little trenches all around the camps to identify that they had V-shaped ditches. Um, he didn't, wasn't generally recording dating evidence. He wasn't recording a huge amount of information, but he was verifying that they were Roman to such an extent that nowadays we can, we can look at a site that we've recovered from the air and can say, well, this is clearly Roman in, um, it's clearly a Roman period site for various features, and we don't have to do with these slot trenches now. But to give you an idea, all those little crosses there are sites that St. Joseph put trenches in. And although the, we're only talking a weekend in September um, that he spent doing it, that's a huge number of sites that he's put trenches through. And then, of course, one of the things that's actually revolutionized our understanding of camps in recent years is the work at Kintore. And in comparison with these little slot trenches that you see here, Kintore has seen a massive area of its interior <coughs> excavated, and the slide on the, the image on the left just shows the areas that have been recorded. Although the site was originally recorded as an earthwork, it was predominantly known as a crop mark. And the excavations have now shown um, something like 180 ovens, rubbish pits, that are actually telling us li about life of the soldiers. And we're not just looking at big fields with um, remains of ditches in. They're actually starting to tell us about the interior of these structures. And the first volume of Kintour was published a few years ago and the second volume is due out next year. And the bottom right is one of the ovens that was recovered from Kintour. I think prior to Kintour, the most ovens that has, a site had produced was something like four or five. And as I say, Kintour has 180. Whether or not Kintour is particularly special, um, although I think the excavators would love it to think so, it would be wonderful to think that that scale of excavation on another site might produce this level of inf information, and it does revolutionize our understanding. So that brings us on to survival. Some of the ones in, um, in Scotland are extremely well preserved, some of the ones in northern England and in Wales. Upland areas, by and large, you might get them surviving. Internal features, very rarely seeing anything surviving. What we do get are the ramparts and the ditches that surround these things. And this is Pennymuir um, in the Scottish borders, close to the border with England. And um, this is a um, this is Kirkbudo in Angus. And in case you're wondering, that is the director of the society standing in a ditch. Um, not, but he's an Iron Age specialist. He wasn't particularly happy to be dragged around Roman sites, but he was prepared to model for me. The um, most of them, as I say, survive as crop marks. So you'll see the arrows pointing out the crop mark feature. And you saw the big ditch that I showed you previously. And as you can imagine, once that is ploughed flat, it still leaves quite a trace in the landscape. And the crops grow differently over it. And that then produces the crop marks that actually help us to interpret these things. Um, the site on the left here is the fortress at Inchtooth, our, our one Roman fortress in Scotland. But just to the right of it, um, there are uh, actually three camps on the plateau. You can you mainly see one that's got two phases here. Um, and again, it's 
it's a lot of them are found outside forts, and the forts or fortresses may have been known for years, but the camps have only been recorded more recently. And here's a detail of the camp. And this is another one where you can see internal features. Um, there have been a handful of these pits over here excavated, and they're rubbish pits. But again, you know, the Pintor, as I say, demonstrated the amount of, uh, amount of material you could find in the interior of one of these camps. And each tooth hill demonstrates that we could dig some more of these things and probably find a lot. Some of those, some of those things will be ovens, some will be pits, rubbish pits. Now, as I say, we have got more in Scotland um, than there are in England and Wales, which is another thing that was jumped upon by the press in our, in our press releases recently, that um, there are numerically more in Scotland than England and Wales put together, which obviously that, that really piqued the interest of some of the, some of the writers. Um, but again, it's, I'll come back to why that is, but it is essentially to do with the Roman army's attempts, repeated attempts to conquer Scotland. But that does mean that um, we have a fantastic archaeological resource here, and it's a fascinating subject for study. As I say, going back to the nature of where they are in, in Scotland and the location. Now, I thought I would then, um, I've sort of talked around what they look like a little bit, but essentially, as I've said, rectangular, if you think of rectangular or square structures, they can deviate depending on topography, although I have visited sites where you've got really quite undulating topography and they have plonked a camp that looks like this. And there are areas of the camp which you would not occupy. You couldn't pitch a tent on it without everybody sliding out of the tent because it's so, it's so undulating. And that's where you start to get into the mindset of the camp prefect who would have actually decided where the, where the camp was to go. And there's a complete bloody-minded mentality that you can see in some of these things. No, we build them like this, so we're going to build them like this, even though there's going to be dead ground in the camp. Other sites where you've got a ridge, they've actually tailored the camp around the ridge, um, which is a much more sensible thing. And so you can, you can almost start thinking, okay, that camp prefect strikes me as being a, little more, a bit more intelligent than the camp prefect who puts it on dead ground. But essentially, because we are looking at what appear um, in the crop mark and indeed earthwork record to be empty enclosures until you actually excavate them and find these ovens. Um, that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with sort of thinking about how they operated internally. And you've got to think of these things with large headquarters tents in the middle, um, the soldiers' tents all around the sides, and actually think of them in the way of a fort, but just with leather tents instead. When it comes to the layout of the fort, they were laid out in, in particular ways, in the same way that Romans did town planning with the Groma. And so, again, this is another, um, another link in with other methods of surveying, but it, it, how it gives us an idea of the engineering skills. Now, when it comes to their defences, by and large, we have ramparts and ditches. Um, we've looked at those before. But we also think that there would have been additional defences. Now, this, um, this photograph is, was taken at Archeolink, and one of the suggested reconstructions was that the spears that the Roman soldiers carried were lashed together in what we would call a caltrop style arrangement to actually provide this sort of barbed wire effect to provide additional defense to the camp. And that's certainly one possibility. Um, another reconstruction, and this one is at Carnuntum in Austria, has suggested that those stakes are done in a different way. In the right kind of survival, and it's possible that excavation of a camp rampart might actually produce some form of hole, stake hole, where we can actually start to identify how, that's, how this may have been. I love this photograph in particular because there you get the idea of the tents beyond, but I love the idea that you've got your nice rubbish bin outside and a display board telling you where to pitch your tent. Gates. That's the other reason, one of the reasons we can recognize sites as being Roman, not just a straight crop mark, because a straight crop mark could be a pipeline. Um, the rounded corners and the, the, um, and the jigsaw puzzle of quite often piecing together different photographs. But entrances is quite often the easiest way and the, um, of recognizing a Roman site. And these are essentially the types of gateways we have. The top ones are these curved entrances called claviculi, um, and they are we can sort of date those quite tightly. Um, they're primarily found in the earthwork record because a lot of them didn't necessarily have accompanying ditches, so you can't necessarily recognize them. I know we've drawn them with ditches on this diagram, but they didn't always have ditches. The most common gate form is the middle one, which is called a titulus or titulum. 
um, which is where they basically stopped the gate and then had a little extended bit of rampart and ditch outside. Essentially, all of these gates are designed to make the attacker have to turn and make it difficult. You couldn't just charge a gateway if it had some form of, of protection in front of it. And the clivically, in particular, are very clever because they actually make you turn in such a way that you expose your unshielded side to the people in the camp. Plus, they could also man the curved entrance, and so they could actually, and they would have been obviously on raised ground, so they could have actually attacked anybody trying to attack the camp. Um, the bottom. To the, the second from bottom one is a double curved entrance, but the bottom one is a particular type only recorded in Scotland, known as a Stracathro gate after the site in Angus where it was first recovered. A few years ago, somebody did claim to have one in Spain and then sent me the evidence, and it clearly wasn't the same. It was quite sad. It would have been nice to think that they'd got them in Spain, but right now they do seem to be very much a Scottish phenomenon. Um, and we can possibly date these quite tightly, and I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, in terms of what they look like in the crop mark record, there's a titulus outside a camp. Um, if you're going to actually build a camp some, and you're going to actually change the angle of it, um, you're going to change the angle at a gate. The, as I say, they're quite often done to fit the topography, the size of the armies that are in them, but by and large they didn't build lines that bent at all. If they were going to change an alignment for a reason of topography or fitting the, um, fitting the soldiers in for, for need of size, then they would change it at a gate. So that's why you, you've got the change of alignment there. And there you have the titulus outside, the remains of the ditch. And here's um, a nice little camp at Ward Law in Dumfrieshire. Sorry, that last one was Grassy Walls in Perthshire, where there's this peculiar arrangement of four of them outside. And we have absolutely no idea why there are four there. It could be that there's a training element it could be just somebody saying, well, let's actually really protect this side of the entrance. Well, why they protect that side and not the others? Uh, as you can see, there's another entrance there, but there's no break in the ditch to go with it. And that might be an indication that the camp had more than one phase and the ditch was completely cut through in one phase, but another phase there was a gate there. That's a possibility. Um, this is actually a site in Wales, um, in the Bracken Beacons at Escapervith, and you can see there, this is one of the better examples of an upstanding clavicular, and you can see the little curved rampart coming in there. Now, clavicular are quite, it's easier to date them because they're, own, they're found in um, very specific locations in Britain and indeed around the empire, and by and large, they do seem to be first century BC, first century AD in date. So they, in a Scottish context, we can say, well, that's late first century. So it does help us to start to date these things because by and large, um, we are dating them fairly blind. In terms of pushing them later, there, are, there is a clavicular recorded on Trajan's column. And it's possible that that was actually added to the column after, after Trajan's death. But the latest possible camps with the clavicula that we have are actually in Israel, and they're, in the, um, they're dated to the 130s AD. Um, so in a Scottish context, we don't tend to push them that late, so we do suggest they're first century. And here's a photograph of um, Dalgan Ross near Comrie. Um, there's a Roman fort just poking into the left side of the picture. And as you can see, these distinctive claviculi gates where you've got, or the Stracathra gates, where you've got the clavicula and this external traverse. Again, um, making it awkward for anybody coming into the camp. And in fact, this was one of the ones that was planned by William Roy in the 18th century. And he drew internal claviculi banks as well, which obviously haven't survived the ravages of the plough. But again, this does seem to be a particular type to Scotland. And that, in fact, is a distribution map of these stracathro types in camps in Scotland. They're not all the same size. They're different sizes. Um, so you can't just say, oh, well, it was clearly an army on the march, because they, they range really from quite small to, to quite large in size. And as you see, they're quite geographically quite dispersed. But because camps were constructed, um, the design of a camp was done by one individual, the camp prefect, it's quite possible that the prefect was, um, that it was the same prefect that was employed in all of these, but it actually gives an idea, helps us to understand an idea of the flexibility of the Roman army and that it wasn't just that was a unit and they moved in that unit. This 
camp prefect may have been with a unit and moved around in different sized troops. So he may have, um, his unit may have traveled with a larger army at times, it may have traveled with a smaller army at times. And it perhaps gives us an, just a hint of some of the flexibilities of the Roman army that you don't normally get when you're studying forts or reading the literature. So again, it's something else that we can start to tease out from camps. Now, when it comes to Stracathra gated camps, they were all, with the exception of being recorded in the, in the 18th century as, as earthworks, they're all by and large known as crop marks until about six years ago when um, a colleague of mine was looking at the photographs. There's a very nice long bank barrow down the middle of this photograph, which you should just be able to see. This is outside the fort at Ravenfoot in Dumfries, and Ravenfoot's just poking into the, north, uh, the, the top side of the photograph. And this is a Estelle Muir, and you can, can, I don't know if you, you can really see very clearly from those arrows, but there are some um, earthworks coming down here and in fact, just on here, you can see there's one of these oblique ditches. And that is the remains of a Stracatho camp. So we all got very excited about this um, about, as I say, five or six years ago when it was first discovered. Not least because we'd actually already surveyed the earthwork and completely missed the fact that there was a camp there. But I think it is, I think it is the boggiest, wettest part of Scotland. So I don't know if they just surveyed it in a bad in a bad year. Um, I was fortunate to go down and survey it in glorious sunshine, so I don't know what they're talking about. But um, we, what we did is we did a survey of the site and we did a detailed three-dimensional terrain model of the gates. And in fact, this is the north gate and the line running down the middle is that um, nearly the bank barrow. And you've got the lavicula there and coming up there. And we've had to exaggerate this quite a bit, but it gives you an idea of the of the type of gate that we're talking about. And this is, this is what I mean. This is the weather I had when I was down there. Everyone says it rains in Estelmuir. And um, the poles are on the, on the west gate, and it's such a subtle earthwork that that was it. That's taken from doing a, um, walking over the site with a GPS survey and literally taking measurements every pace. Um, and that's with a times three exaggeration. It's an incredibly subtle earthwork. But we now finally have one of these in outstanding earthwork form which does, um, I think, give us hope to actually surviving other upstanding camps in Scotland that we've just, for some reason, only partially recorded or missed entirely. Now, as I say, the gates, we can, we, the Stracathra gates, we can link quite closely into the late first century, as so for various reasons um, to do with analogies. None of them have, been, uh, have produced any form of firm dating evidence, and I will come back to dating evidence shortly. When it comes to gates, these are the types of gates that we get. So the majority of gates that you get in Scotland are the titulus, titulus gates with the, with the additional stretch of ditch outside. We get a few clavicularly, some stracathra ones, and you can see there's quite a few where there's a gap and we don't know. So they may well have had earthwork features that weren't accompanied by ditches and have been ploughed out. And then we have quite a few where we don't know. Now, another element of form when we're studying these things is a handful of, a handful of camps have attached annexes have little camps attached to them. None of these have been excavated. We don't know um, what they were there for. They are a particular feature of one series of camps known as the, um, the 63 acre or 25 hectare group of camps, which I'll come on to in a minute. But you do get them on other sites as well. And there have been all kinds of suggestions ranging from slaves that they had to particular um, important people. But I kind of feel if you had important people traveling with the army, you put them in the middle of the camp. You wouldn't just tack them on to a bit at the end. Um, but again, it's one, it's one of the unknown elements of camps that makes them, that makes them sort of so enigmatic and so interesting to study. And um, a colleague of mine in Stirlingshire is talking about excavating a camp that does have an annex. So I've said, please, can you excavate the annex? Because we'd actually like to know a lot more about them. Now, the other thing I'll mention is internal features. I pointed out the ones at inch tooth earlier. I've shown you Dalgan Ross, but I don't know if you can see there's some rows of crop marks in the interior. Um, I don't know how well you can see them coming through there. And when you actually start to measure these rows, they actually measure lengths that conform to what the ancient texts tell us would have been the length of an army camped out. So we can actually start to use these and trace lines and rows of camps, uh, of, of tents, and actually start to estimate possibly what size might, of army might have occupied these. 
Um, there's not very many that have produced these internal features. This is one of the camps at Glenlocha in Dumfrieshire. And again, you can see these rows of pits, particularly around the perimeter, but also internally. These ones are a bit more higgledy-piggledy. They're not quite so much in rows. And in fact, the Kintour ovens and the Kintour pits were in a much more higgledy-piggledy manner. Um, now, another site that um, only appeared as a crop mark with the earthwork, oh, sorry, with the, the ditches visible, we were fortunate to work with a German team a few years ago and take a, one of these huge chariot geophysical surveying equi equipment, um, that one of these ones that's so big you just actually drive up and down the field in a Land Rover with the thing out the back, and um, produced, showed that actually the, the camp at, this camp at Dal Swinton was also full of internal features. So it's quite possible to say that Kintour is not as unique as, as we would th as, as we currently know. Um, and there's actually an awful lot more out there and some more excavation on these sites would actually start to elucidate a lot more. So this brings me to probably the more interesting bit of this is, is what does this actually tell us? Context, date, why is it interesting? What does it tell us about the Romans in Scotland? Well, anything that we do when we're dealing with Romans in Scotland has to fit into some form of historical context. Um, we know that the Romans were, when, when the Romans invaded Britain, we think they got to southern Scotland, late 60s, early 70s. We've got, um, we're very fortunate when we come to Agricola, governor of Britain, in that um, he was very fortunate in his choice of family, in that his son-in-law was the historian Tacitus, who wrote a wonderful biography of him, which has been used to skew the archaeological evidence. Um, but it does actually paint a picture of some of the life in Britain, even if it does paint a sort of slightly bizarre picture of what the occupants of Britain and Scotland were like. And he tells us about a battle called Mons Graupius, which may well be somewhere in this area. And then we know that, um, we know from various forms of dating and evidence that the, um, particularly from the forts, that the conquests in Scotland were abandoned. And they moved down to a line which a generation later became fossilized as Hadrian's Wall. And then after the death of Hadrian, Antoninus Pius needed a quick victory, was possibly dealing with some trouble, moved back into Scotland and built a new, ball, new wall uh, across between the um, Tyne and the Forth, the Antonine Wall. But by the 60s, 160s, they retreated south again. We have textual references to campaigns in the north. We don't know whereabouts that was. We haven't found any archaeological evidence for it yet. We know there's a buy-off of the tribes, and, and there have been coin hoards found um, that may help support that form of evidence. And then the next phase of archaeology that we have in Scotland is the reconquest by it, the Emperor Septimius Severus and his sons, which wasn't finished um, because Septimius died in York in the winter of in February 211. And uh, one of his sons killed the other one and claimed Rome. Why bother with Scotland when you've got Rome as your prize? So they gave, up, um, they gave up Scotland and moved south again. But, I mean, the, when, you, when you read the literary texts of um, Septimius Severus, the only, the only word that comes to my mind to describe him is genocidal. I mean, it's quite, it's quite brutal, some of, the, um, some of the text and the language that's used. And then in the 4th century, um, there's quite a few references to trouble with the Picts. and It's almost a stock phrase, oh, there's trouble in the north, there's trouble with the Picts. But it does seem to be that you've got these additional... Um, these additional troubles and additional problems in the north, which may well have resulted in more ma marching camps being constructed. But again, our archaeological evidence is very, very slight. But what we're dealing with is sites that fit into this broad context. By and large, we're looking at the first century occupation, the second century occupation, and the campaigns by Severus as our three main areas. But some of the camps that we're looking at may well belong to some of these other campaigns. When it comes to dating, We've got four main ways in which we can date sites. Historical context um, on the base of geographic probability, that's a fairly loose way of doing it, but it does help us to start providing um, possible context for these sites. There might be a dated site, a camp might be next to a site that has produced dating evidence, which might help us. It doesn't necessarily mean they were occupied contemporaneously, but it might help put a context behind that. Ground survey and excavation may not actually produce actual dating evidence, but when you've got sites that overlap one another, might help to elucidate sequences between them. And then finally, if we're lucky, radiocarbon dates and stratified artifacts, but they are few and far between. A lot of sites may have found 
produce stray artifacts in their vicinity. But if there's a Roman road going past, you can't really confidently use that to date, to date a site. When you've dated one site, we quite often find that you get sites in sequence. And that's one of the um, wonderful legacies that St. Joseph left us with um, from the pioneering work he did from the 40s to the, to the 80s was actually grouping these things and producing. And he, the stracathro type, the particular gate type that I've mentioned, which are thought to be um, first century Flavian in date, which I'm fairly confident are. The 30-acre camp uh, series doesn't really hold up. That's, uh, that's one that hasn't, I don't think, stood the test of time. The 63-acre or 25-hectare series um, he thought to be severe and no dating evidence, but that was his estimation. And then um, the 110 acre, I mean 120 acre he split, the 110 acre he thought were first century and the 130 acre he thought were third century, severe. And then we also have very big camps south of the fort. Fourth. Now if I actually take these chronologically, first century forts, as I've mentioned clavicularly, and this is a distribution map of clavicularly in Britain. Um, so you can see they go from sort of southwest, particularly quite a number of them in Wales, right up to the Murray Plain. As I've said, this gate type does appear to have gone out of use by the Antonine period. So in a Scottish context, we can quite comfortably say that these are first century in date. And certainly the plethora that there are in Wales do appear to be first century in date. Um, up here, the camp at Kintor has produced um, dates suggesting it was first founded in the first century. There is a later beaker from the fourth century, which may well be one of these later incursions, but by and large the evidence is coming in flavor, favor of it being a first century Flavian foundation. And the other triangles on that map are nearby camps which are the same size and the same shape, morphologically similar, approximately all a day's march apart. So by saying, well, Kintor's first century Flavian in date, we can fairly confidently say that Murifold, Eithen Wells, and Norman Dykes are also first century in date. Now, taking all this evidence and putting it together, we can start to say, well, these camps in Scotland are probably first century in date. They're probably Flavian. And then when you put that at the backdrop of forts, which have produced more dating evidence, you can see a pattern starting to emerge of what the occupation of Scotland was like in the first century. Now, I can't leave the first century without mentioning Mons Graupius. I have, there, there was a debate by somebody recently arguing that Mons Graupius was a figment of Tacitus's imagination. But Tacitus may have over-embellished a skirmish, but he was writing at a time that was within living memory of the people who would have known what was happening at the time. So he couldn't have invented an entire battle. And we've not found it. This is a map of possible locations. Um, as I'm speaking to a northeast audience, I can say, I think this is the best candidate. <laughs> so, um, so, and you're planning on digging Derno at some point, aren't you? <laughs> um, but it's possible that it is somewhere in the vicinity of, um, of Benahi. Uh, Benahi fits the description. I mean, it was St. Joseph liked it. As far as I'm concerned, it's the best of the bunch. I'm very happy to be wrong if someone finds the battle site, but it's got as good enough claim as any. Okay, moving on to the second century, as I say, we've got the Antonine Wall, that's the fort at Rough Castle with the, with the wall going off from it. And I've already mentioned the construction camps that we can date that run along the line of the wall. And there are one or two other sites. This is at Kirkpatrick Fleming in southwest Scotland, where the site I've ringed, which is a possible third camp, a possible annex to, to a larger camp, has produced Hadrianic, late Hadrianic pottery, which in a Scottish context you'd probably quite comfortably put in the Antonine period. So that's a site that's produced dating evidence suggestive of second century occupation. There's possible second century um, pottery from uh, one of the camps at Line here. Um, another one, this is another one of these ones where dating by analogy is useful. South of the river, there's a Flavian fort. North of the river, there's an Antonine fort. The two camps are on the north side of the river. That might suggest their second century in date, because if they're first century in date, they might have put them next to the fort. They might have put them on the south side of the river. That's the kind of thing we're grappling with. We haven't got very good dating evidence. As I say, the second one has produced something at second camp here. But it, it's that kind of analogy that we're using to try and tease out dates sometime. This is Dunning in Perthshire. 
where excavations, I mean, you can, you can tell where the excavations were because there's a housing stain on top. But excavations here in the fill of the titulus ditch produced pottery that was second century in date. But because of where it was in the fill, it may have been a secondary occupation of the camp. And up until that point, this camp was always grouped in a sequence because it's the same size, same shape, and a day's march apart from one at Abernethy. Um, and I'll show you a ropey crop mark here to give you an example of the one at Abernethy. And that produced first century material during small-scale excavations 30 years earlier. But what that might actually tell us is rather than say, well, hang on, this doesn't compute, this one's first century, this one's second century, therefore the idea of putting the sequence together doesn't work, what you might actually do is have sites that have been reoccupied in the second century. So we might have sites, these sites may be first century and second century and give us an idea of the campaigning army. The best site in terms of dating is this one at Betakind and Frisia, where the, um, a study by Richard Tipping at Stirling University of the Paleo Channels has determined that the sites on the north side of the river, um, which you can just see in the top of the photograph, were formed at a particular point in the Paleo Channels which would have suggested second century or later. And the site on the, on the south side um, is one of these ones that has Stracathro gates, so we're quite comfortable being first century. So that, if I put that in plan form to give you an idea, the one at the bottom where it says Beat at Bank, Bank End is first century and day, but probably the four sequences of camps that you have on the north side are all second century and date. Now, given that this is in southern Scotland, it's between the Antonine Wall and Hadrian's Wall. This is an area which a lot of historians and archaeologists would, would want you to believe was conquered with, with ease. Why are they keep going back to this territory? And it may well be that there's trouble in this part of Scotland. It may well be that there are policing activities that we can see going on here. Um, but certainly, the idea that you've got four camps reoccupied um, in, a, in, an, as I say, in an area that was conquered suggests that they were going back and back. So it might be an indication of trouble. And taking this camp, we can then look at a, one of the camps, the fort at Crawford, north of the river. But one of the camps south of the river is a similar size and shape. So we can say, well, okay, maybe one of these camps is also second century in date. In a Peffrey, which is just across the, fort, um, the river from Stragheath in Perthshire, there are two extremely large camps. Um, the one on the right is 130 acres in size. The one on the left is 63 acres in size. Both were traditionally thought to be third century in date. Um, not on any, any form of dating evidence whatsoever, but that was, they were thought to be the campaigns of Septimius Severus. But excavations um, where the Roman road crosses the West Fort suggested that the Roman road might actually be later than the camp. And because the Roman road almost certainly isn't later than second century in date, that then questions the attribution of this camp and indeed therefore the whole series of 63 acre camps to the Severan period and it might well push it back into the Antonine period. Now a lot of people are so wedded to the idea of these camps being 63 acre that this has been quite a, um, uh, that this, this hasn't been particularly well received. But there is no dating evidence for these sites and you can't confidently say well these are clearly such and such a date without the dating evidence. <coughs> Which brings me to our dock, which is a key site because of the fact, not only do you have a lot of camps here, um, yes, sorry, the, the, the wonderfully preserved Roman fort is poking off the picture because I'm much more interested in the large camps to the north. But excavations on the sequences between the camps have shown that the very big camp, which I've marked number one, which is 130 acres in size, is the latest feature on site. Now, bearing in mind that it cuts over an annex to the fort, and the annex might be second century in date, we might therefore have the possibilities that this large camp could be third century in date. Um, so here we have possibly an example of Septimius Severus. It overlies um, a 63-acre camp, like the one we saw in Epiphery, which, as I say, are previously thought to also be third century Severan in date, but may well be second century Antonine. So in terms of what that gives us in terms of the map, these are the 63-acre camps, which I would now, which have been traditionally thought to be 3rd century in date, which I would now argue are quite possibly 2nd century in date. And we then say, OK, Antonine, Scotland. These are the camps in, in Scotland that we think of to be possibly Antonine in date. Note there's a, a, lone, um, a lone site to the north of the wall. 
But as soon as you add the 63 acre camps in, it starts to present a completely different picture of the activity. And we shouldn't really be surprised that although the Antomine Wall was the frontier line that they held, that they were campaigning to the north. They were actually keeping trouble at bay to the north. Now, third century, the last main series of, um, of campaigns, this is the fortress at Carpu. So this is a, a Roman, um, a, a permanent fortification. But then when we start looking at the archaeological evidence, as I say, I've mentioned Dardoch again. And here is, I mean, Dardoch, some of them are earthworks, but the majority of the remains are crop marks. And as I say, excavations have started to tease out um, the sequences between them. We've got the very, very large camp, which I showed you, but I'll go back one. It's the camp that's marked as one on here um, at our dock. And that's part of a series of camps. And these may well be, as I say, third century in date. It does seem the most likely analogy. They are huge. They are amongst the biggest camps in Scotland. There's only one group of camps that are bigger. And the idea that you've actually got the emperor, the imperial family, his sons traveling with them is a context by which you might have these such enormous sites. And that brings me on to St. Leonard's, which is the largest one. I mean, St. Leonard's, you actually have to use about eight photographs to piece it together. Um, sorry, that's a rhyme about the drawing for the prehistoric settlement this year, but actually that's the camp there, there's a gateway. And that's it going off. It's not possible to show the whole camp in a single photograph because it is so enormous. And I say that's the plan of the camp. It's 170 acres in size or 70 hectares. And the most likely context for something that's this huge is that you, I say there's no dating evidence from these, but the most likely context is that if you've got the emperor and his Praetorian Guard, and all his administrators, because he was essentially running the empire while he was on campaign. You think of the amount of administrators, um, you know, Whitehall traveling with, um, traveling with the Roman Emperor, that that might be a context for these utterly vast camps, which, as I say, was, it was until last year the biggest known anywhere in the empire. These are huge, and that's the best context. No dating evidence, but it's the best evidence. Newstead, Scottish borders, also, it potentially, there's a huge camp here in the same sequence. And in fact, it's the camp with the Roman numeral five. Now, there have been excavations in the northern part of this. The ditch is very, very large. The ditch is possibly been recut for field systems. But even if it hadn't been recut, um, there have been suggestions from the excavations that it is later than the annex. So this is a hint that, again, this might be third century, which would fit with our analogy. So we are clutching at straws a bit, um, but that then, the, um, the triangles in this one, which are Pathhead, Channel Kirk, St. Leonard's, and Newstead, are these four enormous camps in south, southeastern Scotland, which, as I say, may relate to the campaigns of Septimius Severa. So we've got some big ones in the southeast, some big ones running through Perthshire and Angus, which may well be third century in date. But as I say, all of this is in context. And this is put against the backdrop, the historical backdrop that I identified earlier, plus also the, um, the geographic distribution that we have of camps. But I want to leave you with an image. I've shown you lots of plans, really crop marks of empty fields. And this, to my mind, is the best image I've ever seen of a Roman camp. I can thank Ridley Scott for this, because this is from the film Gladiator. Blink and you miss it. You have to have a DVD to capture it. But um, it... it to my mind, it conjures up, because when we look at the crop mark record and we look at the evidence, we are dealing with ditches in lovely, peaceful fields. Whereas actually, I mean, I was trying to describe it to somebody recently, you've actually got these rows upon rows of tents, muddy, dirty, smelly, horses, men, um, heaven only knows what other accoutrements they brought with them in terms of merchants, prostitutes, and whoever else followed an army. But you've got... Um, they, they'd have needed a toilet, they would have had, they would have had cooking pits. Um, and, but the evidence that that leaves, with the exception of what the kind of evidence that we're getting from Kintore, the rubbish pits and the, and the ovens, they were only in these sites for a few days, a few weeks at most. And if you imagine something like Tea in the Park or Glastonbury, where you've got, okay, they're not organized in rows like this, but you've got tents in a big field, and the idea that you then that that happens for a weekend, a few days. The tents all disappear and you're left with a muddy field. Okay, nowadays, with it being with modern disposable culture, it's strewn full of litter. 
But once you've picked up the litter, that's what you've got. Six months later, can you tell that they were there? So we're very fortunate um, in having sites like Kintour, which have started to produce some evidence, but also in the fact that whenever they went anywhere, they dug a big ditch and they put a rampart outside it. And that's how we know where they are. Thank you very much. Thank you.